Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. You're welcome to the service today. This is the King Scott Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. We're going to continue from the series we started recently, last week, uh, to be more specific, titled Praying Over the Mountains of Society. And today will be part two. Let's start off with prayers. Eternal Father, we thank you. Thank you for you are God. Lord, your wisdom is amazing. <clears throat> your wisdom is awesome. We reverence you. We honor you. We acknowledge, Lord, your sovereignty. We acknowledge your omnipotence. We acknowledge your wisdom and we give you thanks. We bow before your majesty. Thank you for your Holy Spirit whom you've given us to be our teacher, to be our guide to unveil truth, to reveal mysteries to us from your word. And Lord, we thank you. Thank you. Holy Spirit will welcome you. Teacher, guide, helper. Guide us into all truth. Unveil truth of God's word to us. Illuminate our hearts. Cause the light of the word of God to flood our hearts and our understanding to the glory and praise of the holy name of our God and our Father. And for that, we say amen and amen and amen. Again, you're welcome. This is the King's Court Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. We started off a series last week, which we titled Praying Over the Mountains of Society. And uh, we did start off by saying that it's not, you know, the, 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 some people have taught on what they call the seven mountains of influence, seven mountains of culture, seven mountains of society. Yeah, we, we do have some of those in here, but, you know, it's not exactly the same. Uh, we'll have them right there on the screen. Spirituality to be number one. We consider that to be the first mountain. And then we have science and technology, the next mountain. We have government, the mountain of government. We have the mountain of the family. Uh, we have the mountain of arts. We have the mountain of commerce and the mountain of academia. We're going to be explaining all these as we proceed. Looking at the flyer there, uh, it depicts what we see declared in, in Micah chapter, chapter uh, 4 and Isaiah, Isaiah also. Isaiah, I believe, chapter 4 and Micah chapter 4 as well. Uh, praying over the mountains of society. We're talking about, it says, the mountain of the Lord's house will be exalted over the mountains. Now, of course, when you're talking about the mountain of the Lord's house, you're talking about the Holy Spirit because he's in charge of the operations of God's kingdom. So we have the Holy Spirit there represented in form of a dove, like we know scriptures portray. But we see he's exalted over these other mountains. And the idea is for the Spirit of God to rest upon and brood upon these mountains so that each one of them not only receives the fire of the Spirit, but begins to... Uh, 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 um, look more like, you know, something that is influenced by the Spirit of God, which we see depicted in the fact that they, the, the, the coloring of those mountains, it's almost like what we have in the realm where the Spirit is operating from. And then we also have the scripture that, you know, we, which we saw last week, where the guide, the tour guide uh, of, of the mountain of the Lord's house you know, gave a law, a guiding rule, a guiding principle, a governing principle of the mountain of the Lord's house. So the surrounding area at the top of the mountain is most holy. So you can see we, we separated that with, you know, a different color. And that's the realm of the spirit. That's the realm of the operations of God. That's the realm of God's holiness. Now, we're going to see later on that Revelation reveals that the woman, Mystery Babylon, is actually sitting on over the mountains. And that is why these mountains have become uh, something else. So they are a different color right now. But then our prayer and where we want to get to is that all of these mountains will receive the influence of the Spirit. But we have work to do as God's people. We have a part to play. Let's proceed. So the goal again of this message is to help God's people align ourselves with God's agenda as his co-laborers in the earth. We know that. Every child of God, well, most children of God know, if you, especially if you're one who reads your Bible or who's in a very good church where the preachers preach the word of God, you know we're called to be co-laborers with God. 
So this message comes to help us as co-laborers of God. Now, when you're talking about being a co-laborer with God, uh, a number of things come to play. First and foremost, you must understand because you can't embark on a labor that you know nothing about. You cannot say, I've come to help you or I've come to work, but you don't know what the job is about. You don't know the goal or the vision or the purpose, you know, or what the job is about. You just be making a mess of the whole thing. And unfortunately, that is what we have going on in, you know, in ministry today. A lot of people are in ministry, but do not understand the purpose of ministry, do not understand the agenda, the goal, the vision, what God is trying to accomplish, which you call the mission DA, the mission of God. We've got to know that first. There has to be an understanding of the agenda of God for creation. When we understand that, then the next thing is to align ourselves with it. Because a lot of people are in church or are serving God, quote and unquote, for different reasons. A lot of people are serving God because they were told God will do for them what they want. Oh, okay. If he's going to do what I want, then I'll serve him. <laughs> if God is going to, you know, be my servant, be my messenger, do whatever I want, like a genie in a box, whenever I need him, he just goes to work on my behalf. Okay, I like that. But we have to understand that God has an agenda. Most people in church today only focus on the promises of God. And that there are some churches today that focus only on promises. They scour through scriptures looking for promises. Every promise that you find in scriptures. And some they don't even have revelation of. But they only hold on to promises. But child of God, you must understand the word of God is not all about promises. As a matter of fact, the first and foremost word of God, going back to Genesis, is about purpose. It's about let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over. So there is a purpose for which God made man, made humans. Let's begin to use the word humans so it won't look like we are, you know, excluding uh, you know, but the, the word man there is generic, so it's, there's no gender war here. So, but there is the word of God is also instructive. The word of God is also a guideline. As a matter of fact, most promises in the word of God are predicated upon commandments, predicated upon instructions. If you do, this will happen. If you do this, you get this. Oftentimes we just stay with the promise, but we don't care about the instructions, then that's not right. We, God has an agenda, people. God has an agenda he's trying to accomplish. Those who embark on the agenda of God must know what that agenda is, understand it, and then align themselves to it. Those are the ones who can actually claim the promises of God in reality. Of course, God is a father. He's a generous God. His mercy is in yours forever. He's generous to everyone. The Bible says he reigns upon the just and, and the unjust. So God is not one who makes a, a differentiation when people come to him for anything. But again, understand, we are not called to live off of the uh, uh, benevolence of God. We're called to live off of his purpose. People who live off of the mercies of God, you know, or the benevolence of God only go so far. But those who understand the agenda of God and begin to live off of his purposes are those he calls sons. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Children are born, that's it. Rejoice, celebrate, but sons are given. Sons understand what the father wants done and they get it done. So we must align and then begin to execute our part in God's revealed agenda. A lot of people in church today are just living off of the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God, not out of purpose. A child of God who is on purpose knows that with every waking day or every morning, there is job to do. There is something to accomplish. And so we judge ourselves or we measure our success or measure our daily lives based on how much of God's agenda we are accomplishing. But if you just wake up and you live off of God's mercy, God's blessings, God's you know, uh, uh, benevolence, kindness, generosity, your life becomes a life without purpose, child of God. And that's not what God wants. But when you wake up knowing I am, I am a co-laborer with God, today we are, we're, I'm here to do you know, something on behalf of God. Oh God, I'm working with God. Holy Spirit, guide me. What are we supposed to be doing today? They listen for the voice of the Spirit and they follow his command or follow his instructions. That is the most beautiful life to live. You live knowing that you are a part of a bigger thing going on 
in the entire realm of, 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 of you know, creation or existence. So of course, that the, one of the natural things that comes out of that is to pray for the manifestation of that agenda of God that has been revealed to us. So we begin to posture ourselves. So you're not just praying, you know, prayers that are spurred by, 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 by the moment. You know, oh, Satan is coming. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Oh, God, do this for me. Oh, God, give me promotion. This and that and that. So our prayers are only motivated out of circumstances. That's not right. But we should pray based on purpose. A child of God who lives according to the purposes of God, even your prayers are motivated by the purposes of God. So even when you see things that are not in accordance with the purpose of God, you can say, uh, 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 no, no, that's not right. Because according to the agenda of God, which I have signed up for, that should not be happening. So I reject it. And that's where the church should be. Whatsoever you bind on earth should be the what has been bound in heaven. So you know what heaven has bound, you bind the same on earth. You know what heaven has allowed, you allow the same on earth. You live a life of purpose. Your prayer is a prayer of purpose. And then if God gives an instruction or the Holy Spirit gives an instruction, you make it your duty to bring that instruction to pass, to accomplish that instruction. That is what it means to serve God, people of God. Serving God does not mean go to church and sit down and say amen and then go back home. No, serving God is co-laboring with God, knowing what he wants you to do and doing it. Then you can say, yes, I am serving the purposes of God. One of the functions of the genuine apostolic ministry, I mean, I people talk about apostle, apostle today, but one of the genuine functions of, a, one of the functions of the genuine apostolic ministry is to search out divine templates. Apostolic ministry is about finding out what God has ordained, templates that are in the word of God and then establish them on earth. That goes in line with what Jesus prayed. So you see a man of purpose, a person of purpose. Jesus's prayer was, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The son of man has come not to do his own will, but the will of him who has sent him. Say, as my father works, even so I work. I do nothing except what I see. My, that is a person of purpose. And that is what God is calling his church to, calling his people to, calling you as a child of God to. And so those who are called to the apostolic ministry, and by the way, please let me again, I've said this before, being called to the apostolic ministry doesn't automatically make you a perfect person, doesn't even automatically make you a mature person. Please, people get that. It's just a job role. It's just a function. It is how you're wired. It's like saying an engineer, somebody is, you know, graduated as an engineer. Okay, it doesn't mean they know everything about engineering. Okay, it doesn't mean, oh, they don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean, oh, they are better than everybody else. No. How do you measure that? How do you measure between a medical doctor and an engineer? Say, who is better? It doesn't work that way. The medical doctor is an expert in his field. And when we need a medical expert, oh my God, he's the guy to go for. Or she's the person to go for. But when we need an engineer, that's not where we need the medical doctor. What we need is an engineer. The engineer is the person for the job. We have this mentality in church today, which is why a lot of people have issues with this fivefold ministry, because they think, oh, if you say, oh, God has called me to be an apostle, they think you're exalting yourself beyond measure. Please, child of God, please, ministers, please, church, that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. So when you say God has called me to be an apostle, it doesn't mean, oh, you're trying to make yourself somebody you are not, or you're trying to elevate yourself to a state. It's not a status symbol. It's a function. Is a role, is an assignment, is a job. And there is a job description that goes with it. So those who say they are called to the apostolic, what we should be looking for is, are they wired in that direction or in that manner? Now, if they're not wired, then we can question and say, uh, what dimension of the apostolic are you called to? A lot of people just want to take it as a title. It is not a title. Let's say that again. He himself gave some to be not to be called, but to be. That's who they are. That's what he himself made them to be. So if he has not made you, please don't call yourself that. 
if he has made you, people Paul said, I magnify my office, magnify your office. If you're not sure, just keep doing your work. A man's gift will make room for him. Let your work speak for you. People will eventually recognize, hey, brother, hey, sister, what you're doing looks like an apostolic function. And by the way, I just bust a bubble right there. The callings of God are not gender specific. Please get that. I know that's not my message today, but I don't know why I'm going there. The callings of God are not gender specific. For instance, even in natural uh, um, secular employment, teacher, for instance, you don't say teacher and teacheress. No, no, it doesn't work. You don't say doctor and doctoress. You don't say engineer and engineeress. It doesn't work like that. So there are certain roles or job functions that are not gender specific. It is also try to make everything gender based. It doesn't have to be because the callings of God are packaged in the spirit and your spirit is not a gender based concept. You cannot look at the spirit of man and say, oh, that's a female spirit or that's a male spirit. You can't do that. Spirit is not even, you know, uh, uh, subject to, to gender description. So, one of the functions of the genuine apostolic ministry is to search out divine templates from the word of God, engage those templates, and seek to establish them. So you're going to see God will give people who are called into the apostolic ministry, you know, the, the, the wiring of being able to see certain scriptures and things unfold out of that. It doesn't make them better than the prophets. Some people think that, oh, the apostle is here, the prophet is here. Who told you that? No, God didn't do that. He himself gave some to me. He didn't say this is better or that is better. In fact, when Paul said, uh, put apostles forth, he's saying that in the, um, in the, in the, in the, what's the word I'm looking for now? In the, when it comes to church setting, when it comes to establishing church, you're going to find that, that it is better for apostles to go forth first when it comes to church establishment. One of the problems we've had in modern uh, uh, generation is that pastors have gone forward. Pastors have been elevated, you know, so we have this pastoral mindset, pastoral ministry. So pastors have been pushed forward, but pastors really do not establish the church of Christ the way it should be because the pastoral mindset is not, now again, it's not a matter of whether they are, uh, um, who I don't know how to help us not get not even think about who is better than the other. No, the way God has wired up the apostolic people or great people who are called to the apostolic ministry is such so that they are able to lay foundations. They're able to lay proper foundations. So when proper foundations are laid, God's people understand what God wants done. Such churches, my God, will grow very fast. Grow not in numerics, not in numbers, not in people. Grow in the understanding of Christ. Don't forget, there is a growth that is measured upwards, and there is a growth that is, that is measured horizontally. The Bible says that we might grow up into him. That is the first growth, growing up into Christ. Expansion, or numerics, or people coming to church and all of that comes later. But the first growth God looks at is, do you look like my son, Jesus Christ? Is this the church of Jesus Christ? Or is this another church that humans have erected? Some people might say, oh, I planted 10,000 churches. Question is, are they the churches of Jesus Christ? How do you know? Because they will mirror Christ. They will look like Christ. And, and so the apostolic grace is given the grace to be able to lay proper foundations so that God's people can look more like the, 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 the template in the Bible. I got to move on because I have a lot to say um, going forward. But anyway, that is exactly what Jesus meant in Matthew 6, 10. Thy kingdom come, but more specifically, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there are people he has called to do that. So minister of God, make that your aim. Am I establishing the will of God on the earth? First and foremost, do I know what the will of God is? Do I know how it is in heaven? Because if I don't, then it's most likely you're going to be establishing something that doesn't look like heaven. May God help us. I got to move on. Now, religion and the traditions of men often set aside the word of God. And this is where, again, I'm sorry, the pastoral ministry misses it. Because the pastoral ministry is wired in such a way that it is drawn to the people. It has... Uh, the pastoral grace 
comes with a shepherd heart, comes with, you know, care for the people, care for the flocks, care for humanity. They are compassionate. They are merciful. And that's not to say the others are not, but it is their strengths. So you're going to see them lean more towards the people. I'll give you a very good example. Uh, Moses was up on the mountain as a pro an apostolic and prophetic graced person receiving templates from God. You see that now? Receiving a template from God that he was going to establish on the earth. Receiving something from heaven, something from above, which was going to be the, the commandment. And he's going to establish it on the earth. Now, when the children of Israel didn't see him come down on time, they turned to Aaron. And Aaron is the pastoral. Aaron is the priest. Aaron is the people person. Aaron wants the people, loves the people. And somehow they forced Aaron to build a molding calf, a golden calf. See that? So, but Aaron, if Aaron had understood the, the templates of heaven, he could have said, no, guys, no, we're not going that direction. Do you know exactly what you're talking about? Do you know you're about to establish another religion? Do you know you're about to establish an abomination in the earth? Don't you get it? Don't you understand that this is not the template of God? Let's wait until Moses comes back. He is dead. No, he can't be dead because he's a man of purpose. God called him. God is dealing with him in, 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 up on the mountain. And there's no way this God who has kept us alive in the wilderness can allow that man die because we've not entered the land of promise yet. See how, that's how they think. But he yielded, he caved in to the pressure and then established a religion or an, ab actual, I should say, an abomination on the earth. I'm not gonna stay long on that because I have so much to say. But traditions of men often set aside the word of God. Now, when I say set aside the word of God, please understand it's not just the text because somebody can say, no, we, we have the word of God. Isn't it Matthew chapter one, verse one? Look at it now, it's Matthew chapter one, verse one. So you may have the text, but you have the revelation of the word. Do we have the revelation of the word? Because some people may say we have the text, you know, we're following the Bible, but just having the text is not enough because Paul tells us the letter can kill. The letter can bind. The letter by itself alone can become uh, uh, something that puts people in captivity. It can tend towards legalism. It can tend towards heresy. It can tend towards false teachings. Do you have the revelation of the word which comes through the spirit? So religion sets aside the revelation of the word. Traditions of men, because traditions of men wants it to be the same way as it was in the beginning. So shall it be with, you know, to the end, world without end. No, who says that? We want to do what God says done. We're not going by tradition. This is how our fathers used to do it. That's traditions. No, we want to do it as God says, as the spirit says. We must not set aside the word of God and not just the text, but the revelation of the word. And then religion and traditions of men goes ahead to establish man-made doctrines. And sometimes, child of God, they are high-sounding concepts that appeal to the flesh. Oh, my God. They appeal to the flesh. But you see, a man or a woman of God who has been in the presence of God and understand divine agenda, understand the templates of God, cannot cave into that pressure. Because you know you're going against the pattern. God told Moses, see to it that you build according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. You've got to build according to the pattern or else you will raise up abominations in the earth and many have done. So these things may be appealing to the senses, appealing to humans, appealing to people. You build a crowd. Overnight, your church is filled to overflow because people like to hear it. They have a tingling ear. They like sensationalism. They like you to tell them what they love to hear, not just the truth, because sometimes the truth will, will sting you. They don't want that. And you are pounding your chest because your church is growing in numbers. But these things have no basis in scripture. A lot of doctrines out there. A lot of practices out there by many churches, mega churches and even smaller ones. And then they have no basis in scripture. Child of God, I want to say this to you. And minister of God, if you truly want to serve the Lord, if you're going with a concept, no matter how appealing it sounds, if you cannot base it in scriptures and there's no revelation in it that is from scriptures, I say put a pause on it. Put a pause. I won't say throw it away, but I say put a pause on it. 
clarify from God, clarify from the spirit before you run with something that God has not ordained. And when we do that, when we set aside the word of God, not just the text, but the spirit of the word, what happens is that, you know, you establish man's will on the earth. And sometimes you can be so oh, kingdom, kingdom. We are kingdom people. We are kingdom people. We are here to do kingdom. But you are actually establishing man's will on the earth. How can you be saying you're doing kingdom, but yet it's man's will you're establishing on the earth? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not as it is on the earth, not as it is in the world, not as you think, oh man. So at every point in time, each human being, including ministers of God, will engage in one of the following. It's either you engage in God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, or you will find out you will engage in self-will be done on earth as it is with self-will. Or you will find that young, at a particular point, you are engaging in the will of the world be done on earth as it is in the world. Or God forbid, what still, you may actually find that you are engaged in the will of Satan be done on earth as it is in the satanic kingdom. Please, child of God, know that at every given time, at every given point, each decision we make, each option we choose, each choice we opt for, either of these four things are happening. It's either you're glorifying God or you're glorifying self, or you're glorifying the will of the world, or you're actually establishing a satanic order. Think about that. That's why it's so critical. So, so critical. So let's get back to our subject, the mountains of society. We've got to ask ourselves the questions, whose idea it is? Is it, is it God's idea or is it human idea? And the reason I ask that is because when you look at some things people have postulated as mountains and they're preaching it, some have written books and made a lot of money out of it, you got to ask yourself the question, whose idea was that? Where did they get it from? Who should we follow, man or God? That is a plain question. That is a general question. Uh, Peter asked the same thing to the Sanhedrin who told them to stop preaching the word of God. He said, you, George, whom should we follow? Should we follow man? Should we obey man or obey God? We would rather obey God than obey man. So I asked the same question, who should we follow, child of God? Who should we follow? Church of Jesus Christ. Are we supposed to be following man or following God? I'm sure everybody's going to say follow God. Fine. That is the correct answer. So if we're going to be following God, then we must now look for his revelation. We must now decide to look for what God has made, what God has ordained, what God has established, what God has revealed. And don't settle for what humans have done or what humans are doing. Because if you come up and say a mountain, and you call something a mountain, but it turns out to be something that humans are doing, you know God is not going to accept that. You may accept it. The world may even accept it, but God is not going to accept that. Because God does his own thing. God does his own thing. But I put it to us that for any concept to be described as a mountain, before you say anything is a mountain of society, it has to meet certain conditions, okay? It has to meet certain conditions. Question is, what conditions? Now, before we begin to talk about the conditions, please know this, and I'm sure we've, we've seen this before. The Bible uses <clears throat> things to, you know, describe other things, analogies. So whenever the Bible uses a prophetic term or a prophetic analogy to describe something else, then it means that that thing that is being described actually contains or has a characteristics, a characteristic that matches the analogy that was used. For instance, the righteous shall be like a tree. See that? So it's talking about the righteous, but it's talking about a tree. So how does the righteous look like a tree? Well, the tree is planted in a particular soil. The soil that the tree is planted in will determine whether the tree will become fertile, grow, you know, blossom, produce fruit and all of that. So this tree, it says, is planted by the river of water, or by the water side. So the water side, of course, is representative of the word of God. It brings forth his fruit in a season, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of their labor, the fruit of their deeds, righteous acts in the earth. Their leaves will not wither. So he uses that. They that wait upon the Lord shall be as Mount Zion. What is Mount, Mount Zion? Cannot be moved. <laughs> okay, you see that? Uh, uh, as the hills around Jerusalem, even so. I mean, the, the Bible uses 
different prophetic terms to describe things. So in this case, the Bible, and not just the Bible, but God himself called these things mountains. He described them as mountains. We saw that, you know, last week, described them as mountains. So if God used the prophetic term mountains to describe these concepts that we're going to be looking into, then it means that these concepts will have some characteristics of mountains. So the question is, what are the characteristics of mountains? Well, number one, what is a mountain to start with? A mountain is a large natural elevation of the earth's surface rising from the surrounding level. That is from dictionary.com. So what we get from here is that mountains are natural occurrences. Take note of that. Mountains are natural occurrences. Humans do not build mountains. You won't find a civil engineer. So oh, what is your area of specialty? So I build mountains. I specialize in erecting mountains. No, you, you won't find that. I promise you that you won't find that. You can build towers and all of that edifices, but humans don't build mountains. Mountains develop as a natural occurrence. All right. So if that is the case, then, then the mountains we're talking about, those concepts that we call mountains, cannot be man-made stuff. They have to be something that come out naturally. In other words, God ordained. They have to be things that come up as a result of the order of God. All right. What is another characteristic of mountain? Mountains are majestic. Mountains are great, grandiose. Mountains are, you know, they look, they, they tower above the surrounding region. They are a beauty to behold. They are majestic in sight. Psalm 36 verse 6 talks about that. Describes the righteousness of God. It said it's like the great or majestic mountains. Can you imagine that? So the man couldn't find anything on earth with which he would describe the righteousness of God, he used the, the highest thing, the loftiest thing, the, the grandiose or majestic thing, mountains. So what does that mean? It means that these concepts we're talking about are also going to be majestic. What does that mean? They cannot be hidden. They cannot be ignored. They're going to be obvious. They're going to be seen or observable by everyone within the surrounding region. Have you ever been to a mountainous region, a city, a village, uh, even a country that has a mountain behind it? Or a mountain, oh my God, it's a, it's a beautiful sight to behold. But no, nothing blocks the mountain. Nothing can say, okay, move the mountain or shut down the mountain. So let me preempt myself. If humans can shut down something, then that thing is not a mountain. And some people have called church mountain, but we know in the last two years, church was shut down. Church was shut down. So if humans can pass a decree, if governors can pass a decree or presidents can pass a decree and say church is closed down because of X, Y, Z, and that actually happened, then child of God, church is not the mountain. In fact, some people may even push to the point of shutting down religion altogether. Some people have tried it in world history. But the mountain we're talking about cannot be shut down by humans because they didn't create it to start with. And that's why we chose spirituality. We're going to come to that. So they can be seen by everyone within the surrounding region. So whatever we call mountain cannot be obscure and, by the way, cannot exclude some people. All right? What other characteristics are there of mountains? Mountains are ancient. Oh, be, this is beautiful. Mountains are ancient. Ezekiel 36 Verse, uh, verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has said of you, aha, the ancient heights, because he was talking about the mountains of Israel, the ancient heights. So even the enemy understands that these things are ancient. And don't forget, when we looked at that, he was talking about the institutions, okay? So they have become our possession. So the mountains form over thousands of years. As a matter of fact, Geologists will tell you some mountains from over millions of years. Now, I have a problem going with that uh, timing because I can't go into details on that. So I'm staying with thousands, right? But they form over thousands of years. Now, right there, you know, they, they, they live beyond generations. 
I mean, nobody can say I saw a mountain when it was forming and I was alive and saw it until it became a full grown mountain. <laughs> nobody can say that. So mountains form over thousands of years, multiple thousands of years. They were here before civilization, child of God. Mountains were here before humans were formed. Mountains were here before any human walked upon the face of the earth. They were here before any civilization. So if you say there are mountains of culture, and yet culture had been before they came, then they cannot be mountains, all right? They are not subject to changing trends. They are not subject to changing cultures. They are not subject to changing peoples, people over time. One generation comes and goes, another generation comes and goes. Okay, that's how they used to do it, but we have changed the way it's done. No, then it's not a mountain. Mountains stand forever. They are not moved. They don't change. They are the way God has ordained them from the beginning. So whatever we call mountains cannot be dated by humans. Now, what I mean by that is no human can say we saw when it started and we saw when it became a mountain. No, humans can date mountains. We have scientific techniques by which you can date how old or how ancient a mountain is. So mountains predate human existence. And so what we call mountains will have to be something God ordained while it was forming the earth. They are foundations of the earth. Don't forget that. Humans came and met them. Not that they came and met humans because they are foundations of the earth. Now, the science, here's another characteristic. The science behind the formation of mountains confirms that they are a part of the earth's foundation. And again, the Bible says that, uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 2. He said, hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. So somehow this prophetic uh, 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 scripture or the, the prophet himself, by the spirit of the Lord, understood that mountains are actually foundations of the earth. If you were to ask them to explain it then, they probably couldn't have explained it. But they would just say, I spoke what I heard in the spirit. I spoke what I saw what was told me that's how i said it and that's why you cannot overrule scriptures child of god don't let the world deceive you scriptures are revelatory we are the ones who are catching up with scriptures but scriptures are way ahead of our time now we know this statement is true because mountains are originally from their different ways mountains are formed but the original formation of mountains happens when what you call lithospheric plates lithospheric plates are plates that are found underneath the earth, the crust of the earth. As a matter of fact, they are considered the foundation of the earth. From, from what has, the studies that have been done so far, those plates are directly above the lava or the, 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 the molten lava that is underneath the earth. So in fact, they are also part of what is protecting the earth from overheating or burning off. So these, these plates are there. Some people say it's six, some people say it's 15, some people say it's 20. Well, I don't know about how many they are because it's possible that they crack. If they've cracked over time, then they, you, know, you can have many here and there. But these plates are all around the earth. And wherever there's a crack, so you have some that meet, but you also have some that have you know, uh, opposite energy that they push aside. And that's why they move, they move around because some can't come together because they are from different poles. They are different, you know, they, they have different uh, 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 polarizing energy, if you understand what I'm saying. So they can't come together. They push aside. But on the other side, they some come together because they have attractive energy. Their energy brings them together. Now, whenever you have those that come together and they collide together, they force the Earth's crust to move upwards. See that? And of course, we're talking of huge plates here. So they cause the earth's surface or the crust of the earth to come upwards. The next time they collide, they push it further up. The next time they collide, they push it further up. The next time they collide, they push it further up. So mountains are formed by that science. And of course, they form over thousands of years. So as that thing continues to happen, it just pushes it up until this thing is majestic standing tall and then sometimes some of them have cracks within so the molten lava in the earth will seep through and becomes what you call the volcano that becomes a volcanic eruption but again that happens over many years 
So the science confirms that a part of the foundation of the earth that just came out to the surface. Powerful. So we know that the foundations of the earth cannot be man-made. So whatever we call mountains, they are foundational concepts. They uphold life and they uphold societies as we know them, not the other way around. Now, the question arises, why seven? Why do we say seven mountains? Why do people say seven mountains? I have had questions with that before, but I have a few scriptures I want to throw out that make me believe and agree that they are seven in number. Number one is the fact that the number seven is very significant in biblical prophecy. You know that already. Uh, seven days, seven spirits of God. Seven, I mean, the number seven is so prophetic. For instance, the spirit of God is revealed in seven dimensions. Uh, did they, you know, yes, I think a while ago we taught on this uh, and we found that Isaiah was the first prophet to find, to get this revelation of the spirit of, of, of God from a seven dimension, from a seven dimension uh, uh, perspective. Before Isaiah, or before Isaiah 11, you're going to find everybody saying the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of God, the spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord. But when Isaiah came, he broke it down into seven dimensions. So Isaiah got a deeper dimension of revelation concerning the spirit. It says in Isaiah 11, 1 to 2, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesus. So you see the Bible using rod to describe uh, the ancestry of JC, all right? <clears throat> it said the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him or the spirit of lordship shall rest upon him. But it goes on the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So these are dimensions of the spirit. But you saw that was only Isaiah. No, when, when John showed, and John is shown a deeper dimension of the things of God in the realm of the spirit. John is giving a clearer vision of things. So a lot of things that the prophet saw in, in the Old Testament, for instance, Ezekiel, and I saw the likeness of, and it was like, it was like, it came as the appearance of like. So when John came, he was seen face to face. He was seen with clarity. So everything was, John saw was, was a better picture, like high definition compared to what you see in the Old Testament. So John got it right. Revelation 3, 1, this is the Lord Jesus speaking to him in the mountain of, uh, not mountain, island of Patmos. And the Lord Jesus declares that these things says he who has the seven spirits of God. So Jesus himself is declaring that the spirit of God that came upon him is a sevenfold spirit. And that the, the translators use a plural noun, uh, you know, spirits. I don't know if you could say spirits, but is a dimensional thing. Is one spirit we know, but in seven dimensions or seven revelatory dimensions. And Jesus confirms it. I am the one who has the seven spirits of God. And Isaiah said the spirit of the Lord rested upon this one who came from the rod of Jesus. So both of them are saying the same thing. But also as you continue to read in the book of Revelation, you're going to find out the seven spirit of God is also likened to the seven lamps. So the seven lamps are the seven spirits of God. The seven eyes are also the seven spirits of God. You find those in Revelation 4, 5 and Revelation 5, 6. Now, but also you see when mystery Babylon was revealed to John, we are told in Revelation 17, verse 9, that the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And don't forget, this is not man-made. John was taken into the realm of God's visions. The visions of God. We've talked about that. John was made to see things that are, that are in the spirit realm. So it's not like John had a hand in this. It's not like John is the one manipulating things. No, this is how it is in the realm of the spirit. John was simply shown what is in the realm of the spirit. And then he's revealed, or he was shown this woman or this figure, this thing or concept that was revealed to him as a woman, came in the figure of a woman. And the, the, the one who was explaining the vision told John that the seven heads he saw, and we're going to come to that on the beast, of, that the woman sits on seven heads, and those seven heads are the seven mountains. What mountain is this one talking about? And don't forget, he's in the eternal realm. He is not subject to the flaws of human nature. He is not subject to the flaws of the earth realm. He is taken into the realm. He said, I was in the spirit and I was taken into the Lord's day. He's not in the day of man. He's in the realm of eternity. 
So he's seen from a realm that is perfect. So anything that is happening in this realm, child of God, is how it is. And they describe it as seven mountains. So if they say seven mountains, we must agree it is seven mountains. But the problem is that a woman sits over them. It shouldn't be. We're going to come to that. So the woman rides on the beast. Please hear this also. This is a powerful revelation. This woman that was revealed to John rides on a beast. It's called a scarlet beast. In other words, it's reddish. And the red, for instance, the red child of God comes from blood. Okay, we're, we're not talking about that today. This is why God's people cannot have a part in Mystery Babylon. So when you say wealth transfer, please make sure you know what you're talking about. Make sure the Holy Spirit revealed that to you. Make sure you're really, really following God on that. Because if you're talking about the wealth of Mystery Babylon being transferred to God's people, ah, not going to happen. Because she's riding on the beast. What that means, child of God, is that the beast is sponsoring the woman. Even though the Bible says she rides on the beast, what it means is that the beast is carrying the woman. So the beast is projecting the woman as their image, whereas it's a beast underneath. Of course, the beast is not going to present itself to the world and say, hey, guys, I'm the beast. Come and worship me. Nobody will do that. But when they see the woman, pretty, wonderful looking, and all of that, attractive, they are leered. And the Bible said the kings of the earth committed fornication with her because she has a charm that draws the world, the kings of the earth, and all the world was mesmerized by her looks. But underneath her, child of God, is a beast system. But also understand, child of God, the beast does not worship God. Instead, the beast blasphemes God. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, uh, actually it's not from verse 3, but when you get to verse 9, it says, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. And this beast was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So whatever wealth is coming from this woman, Babylon, is powered by the beast. And the beast is blaspheming. As a matter of fact, it's full with names of blasphemy. So there's sorcery tied to it. There is blasphemy in the world of the beast system. So child of God, that's what the Bible says, come out from among her. Don't be a part of it so you don't partake of our plagues. The world of Babylon contains blasphemy. So God will not put his hand on that. And by the way, child of God, think about it. Why do you want to settle for wealth that has been marred in the valleys. When the Bible says that the Lord commands the blessing upon Mount Hermon, it said, you know, it's like the dew of Hermon. For there, the, the Lord commanded the blessing. It's like the oil that came on Aaron's head and dripped down to his bed to the hem of his head. So it comes from above. All good and perfect gifts comes from above, from the Father of lights. So if it's good and it's perfect, it's not going to come from the world. It's not going to come from the beast system. It's not going to come from the valleys. It's going to come from the top of the mountain. And don't forget the governing rule of the, the mountain of the Lord's house. The surrounding area of the mountaintop is most holy. What do you want, child of God? Wealth that has been corrupted or most holy wealth that comes from above. So when you say wealth transfer, no. In fact, Satan doesn't create anything. Satan only takes what comes from above perverts it, which is why the prophet prophesied the mountain of the Lord's house will be established on top, above the mountains. Right now, the mountains are all messed up, but God has prophesied from his prophets that it will, the Lord, the mountain of the Lord's house, and that's not church, I talked about this last week, will be exalted above the mountains. So child of God, we shouldn't be looking for corrupt words, we should be looking for the words that come from above, that come from our Father purified. That's what Jesus said in Revelation 3. He said, because you have said we are wealthy, we got gold, we got silver, we got everything we need. We don't need anything else. And Jesus said, you are poor, you're blind, you're naked, you're wretched. And look at what Jesus said. He said, come to me and get pure gold. See that? He didn't say stay with the one you have. He said, come to me and receive refined gold, gold that has been refined in the fire. Pure gold comes from Jesus it doesn't come from Babylon. I pray we get that. 
So the prophetic revelation shows there are seven mountains. The woman sits on them because humans have yet to learn that we are the caretakers of the earth. Humans challenge God. You know, God, why didn't you do for me? Yeah, 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 yeah. But we forget that God has put us as governors in the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let them have dominion over all the earth. Adam represents humans, and all humans came from Adam. He was made the governor over the earth. But we don't understand this. Thing. We don't take governorship authority over the earth. We don't even know how to do it. And so now a mystery Babylon is sitting over the mountains that govern the earth, that govern society. We got to do something, church, church of Jesus Christ. But we must understand that when the Bible talks about dominion, I just read it, Genesis 126, it's not just man the way you are. We must follow the word of God the way it is. Genesis 126, then God said, let us make man in our image. But he didn't stop there. According to our likeness, then let them have dominion. So you can't skip according to his likeness and then jump from image to dominion. It doesn't work like that. And some people say, oh, the image is the spirit of God. No, it's not. You can the image of God is simply, that's why the word is used, image. Because if you say the image is spirit of God, then you're saying that everybody has the spirit of God, which is not true. Jesus called it rebirth, born again. So if Jesus said born again, it means he died. See that? It, it died, but he's bringing it back to life. When did he die? He died when Adam fell. So Adam had the original spirit of God because God breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. But when he fell, don't forget what God said, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did Adam die natural death? No. But something died in Adam. Something died in Adam. In fact, when the presence of the Lord came, Adam ran in the opposite direction. So that which was made in the image of God and according to his likeness, disconnected from God, his maker, and was now running away from his own maker. So something died. But when Jesus came, he said, I'm going to cause it to come back alive by the operation of the spirit. So the only time you receive the spirit of God is when you're born again. So all humans can't have that. Humans have souls and humans have bodies or image that is made like the image of God. But the likeness of God they do not have until they come to Christ through salvation. It's not enough to just be made in his image. We also have to follow according to his likeness. It is only those who are filled with the spirit of God who can actually exercise authority in the earth on behalf of God. So what are the prophetic mountains? Well, we're going to be taking them one after the other. Today, we're going to start off with spirituality. So going by the criteria we gave earlier, these mountains... Uh, can only be what God did, what God ordained, or what God revealed. And because they are ancient, predating humans, it then means that we cannot be searching after human skin. We have to go back before humans were formed, because that's when they were formed. They were formed before humans were formed. So that takes us to the genesis of creation. The accounts that the Bible gives concerning creation we find in Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, listen to this. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this text right here paints a picture of a beginning, but that beginning was even before the Genesis account started. So Genesis account is a beginning, but not the original beginning. So Genesis account is telling us there was a beginning before this beginning. The Genesis account is the beginning that brought humans into existence and things like we know them today. But there was a beginning before that. So this, this is a complete sentence. It gives a summary of a complete picture. So at this time, we can tell that Earth and all the principles that uphold Earth were in place. Everything that, you know, laws of nature, you know, uh, universal laws of physics, all of that have been put in place. Laws of gravity, electromagnetism, nuclear energy, all of that have been put in place. How do we know that? When we go to chapter 2, uh, verse 2, a different picture is painted. It says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So right there, although this text paints a different picture, but we see a number of things were revealed. Number one, darkness was there. Darkness is the absence of light. 
So if darkness is here, it means there was light. You see that? So you can't say it's the beginning of beginnings. So there was light, but darkness is now here, which is the absence of light. It also says that there was water. If there was water, then it means that water was created before this Genesis account. And by the way, when you go look at it from a, a, the perspective of chemistry, if you have water, then it means you have hydrogen and you have oxygen. Because two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen gives you water. So we know the elements were here. We know the gases were there already. We know water was there. We know hydrogen was there. We know oxygen was there. We know light is there. And when you go into the chemistry of light, what forms light? What forms darkness? All of those things were in place already. So the beginning was before the Genesis account or the Genesis story. God had already established the heavens and the earth. But something happened that now turned the earth to a different story. We now see the Bible says it's without form and void. Now, you cannot say created and then have without form or void. Void means empty. You cannot say, I created. And they say, where is it? You say, nothing, it's empty. No, it doesn't go together. If you created, then something is there. There's something you created. And if you created, that thing you created has a form, has a shape, has uh, uh, occupies space and contains mass. You cannot create and say without form. You cannot create and say void. See that? No. But then the most, more, what I'm more interested about is the next line. It said the spirit of God began to hover over the face of the deep. Now the deep is the basin, which of course was covered with water. So we had oceans at this time already. The Bible said the spirit of the Lord began to hover over them. So the spirit of the Lord is revealed to us also in the beginning, at least the Genesis account. So what some uh, uh, um, renditions say here is the spirit of God was brooding over, you know how uh, uh, hands brood over their eggs, in other words, incubate. So the spirit of God was incubating the waters. Now, please take note. What that means is that there is an element of the spirit upon creation. How do we know that? Because everything that was created on earth, at least from this Genesis account, came out of the waters. And the spirit of God brooded upon the waters. Don't forget, the Bible talks about the firmament. A firmament came and separated the waters so that you have water above the firmament and water under the firmament. So you have water above the firmament and you have water under the firmament. And then when God called for things, first of all, it said, let dry land appear from the water. So even the dry land contains the incubation of the spirit. Then he said, let teeming things, fish, animals from the sea come forth. So they were also incubated by the spirit. Then he said, cattle and all of that, begin to go. they were also incubated because everything came out from the water. Birds manifest in the, in the sky. Don't forget there's water up there too. And then man was taken from the dust of the earth, which came from the water. So the spirit of God incubated all of creation. There is an element of the spirit in all creation. What do you call that child of God? Do you call that church? <laughs> no. Do you call that religion? Uh -uh. God will not give you religion. And church came much later. That's what he calls spiritual. I mean, that's the closest term I can come to. Spirituality. But furthermore, when God created man, man was even given another dimension of the spirit. The Bible said God breathed into the man he had formed from the dust of the earth, the breath of life, and he became a living being or a living soul. So humans carry a dimension of the spirit of God. It doesn't matter whether you're born again or not. As a human being, there is an element of the spirit. So human societies, that is a mountain that God has given. So we call it the mountain of spirituality. I can't say the mountain of the spirit because it's not the entirety of the spirit. It's just a dimension, the brooding of the spirit. So what is spirituality? Spirituality, is, and people, there's a lot of confusion about the definition, but this came from different sources and also, you know, uh, put, putting them together. Spirituality is the awareness, the recognition, or the feeling that life and existence goes beyond the natural. 
or goes beyond what may be discerned by natural senses or physical instruments only. And I added that because humans have invented a lot of things. Natural senses are not good enough. You can't see by microorganisms, for instance. You require sophisticated instruments to see microorganisms. You probably can't see your internal organs, but there are instruments that can see your internal organs. Humans have created instruments. But even with all of that, there is a life or there is a realm that goes beyond the ability of the instruments to decipher or to discern. And certainly natural senses alone cannot discern it. But the awareness is there. The recognition is there. The acknowledgement, the feeling is there. Religion came out of spirituality. People, that pursuit, that feeling, that longing, that desire to connect with that thing that is out there is what drives religion. That is why religion is, you can, I mean, is everywhere. Church is Jesus's project. Church, for me to say God didn't do that. It was Jesus who brought church. And church was like a byproduct of Jesus's kingdom agenda. And the scripture says it cried. I know that may bust some people's bubbles, but, but please don't be offended. That's the truth. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you keys of what? The kingdom. So even the church is supposed to be receiving keys of the kingdom. So a church that doesn't receive keys of the kingdom is not Jesus' church. So Jesus built the church as an extension, a byproduct of the kingdom. Eventually, the church will become or merge into the kingdom. Church is not the end of the story. But all humans have an inbuilt longing, whether you're born again or not, don't matter, whatever religion or no religion at all. All humans have an inbuilt longing, a vacuum that can only be filled by the reality of the spirit who originally incubated creation. It's like going back home. It's like feeling the touch of where you came from because the spirit incubated all of creation. This is how Paul puts it in Acts 17, verse 26 to 28. And he, God, has made from one blood every nation. So you see, racism is dead right there. Anybody still holding on to racism, you are the foolish one. You are the one who doesn't know what you do. You say you are educated, you went to school, Harvard, Yale, whatever, nonsense. You don't know what you're doing. He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times, generation to generation, and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that, but he designed them in such a way that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him like people groping in darkness. But Paul says, although he is not far from each of us, because actually it is in him that we live, we move and have our being. My God, what can be better than that? All humans, no, it doesn't matter. Religion doesn't come in. All humans were formed by God. And we live in him. We move in him. We have our being in him. Because the spirit incubated creation. You can shake it up. So we can confidently say that spirituality is a force beyond humans. Some resist it, but it's a futile resistance. The incubation of the spirit of God is upon all creation. Nobody can, you can shake it up. They close down church. In fact, you might even close down religion, but you can't shut down spirituality. You can't. The longing for the spirit realm, you can't shut that. How are you going to shut that down? You didn't create it. You didn't put it up. Those who reject the true spirit of God will ultimately replace the spirit of God with something else, even if that in itself. Everyone craves this thing that is greater, they know there's something beyond the natural. So the question then is how do we pray over the mountain of spirituality? Going back to what we said earlier, even our prayers must come from the place of understanding. We must know that God intentionally put the mountain of spirituality over creation. This is the reason why God gets involved with humans. This is the reason why God rebukes his people sometimes when they go a-whoring after all the gods. Because he's, he's, a dimension of him is, has been imparted 
This is why people cannot say, oh, tell God to leave me alone. I don't want your God. No, you are foolish. You don't know what you're talking about when you say that. Because if you say, God, leave you alone, you, you will cease to exist. Don't forget, we just read it. In him we live, we move, and have our being. And you're saying he should leave you alone. If he leaves you alone, then you cease to exist. You cease to be. It is his mercy, generosity that is allowing you to stay alive. He made you. You're breathing his oxygen. You're living on his planet. You're drinking his water. You're eating his food. You're enjoying everything he, he, he created. And you say you don't want him. That's why his judgment will be just. Give your life to Jesus if you haven't done that already. We were created by his spirit. We can't shake that off. That's why David said in Psalm 139 from verse 7 to 14, from verse 7, he said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell. So you see, you can't just escape. Even if you go to hell, whether in heaven or hell, he says you are there. So what should you do instead, verse 14? I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. That is the duty of man, to recognize the one who made us, to praise him, to acknowledge him, to worship him. Forget all these other gods you're going after. Forget all these religions. Forget all these demons, your all self. The one who deserves your praise is the one who truly made you. And David says one more thing here. He says, my soul knows that very well. That's a revelation. He's saying that the human soul contains the, 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 oh, the ingenuity of perfection. It is in the human soul that you see the great work that God has done. Your marvelous works are contained in my soul. My soul knows it very well. You may not see it in the outward. That's why you can't judge people from the outside even if they are disabled or look in a certain way because the soul, the human soul, he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. The human soul is a precious thing. That's why God goes after the soul. That's why Satan also goes after the soul. So praying over the mountains of spirituality involves three things. Oh, my time is really running. Number one, that every humans everywhere may acknowledge the limitations of the natural realm that humans may seek and turn to the one true and living God, and in finding him that each person will live out the life that was preordained. John chapter one and verse nine tells us, it says that he's, Jesus Christ is the light who lights upon everyone that is born into this world. So a dimension of God's light was deposited upon every person who entered this world. You carry the light of God, O oh man. You carry the light of God, O oh woman. Come to the one who gave you that light. And this is going to be our prayer. First Timothy 2, 1 to 6, he say, he say I, I exhort first from, from uh, complete Jewish Bible. First of all, then I counsel that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all human beings, for all human beings, including kings and all in positions of prominence, so that we may live quiet and peaceful lives, being godly and upright in everything. He said, this is what God, our deliverer regards as good. This is what meets his approval. He wants all humanity to be delivered and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. For God, and what is the knowledge of the truth? There is one God and there is one mediator between God and humanity, the man Yeshua, the Messiah, himself being a human. And he gave himself as a ransom on behalf of all. So human, if you're looking for somebody to worship or to serve, it should be the one who gave you life. It should be the one who died for you. It should be the one who gave his life as a ransom for you. If you've not received him, please come to him right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you are my savior. I cannot run from your presence. You made me. I come to you, Lord Jesus. Receive me. Forgive me. I'm sorry for living outside of your reality. I'm sorry for living my life like you don't matter. Oh, from today I receive you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior. Accept me. Fill me with your spirit and guide me here on for the rest of my life. Amen. And let's pray. Oh, Father, maker of heavens and earth, we thank you for your spirit released into the earth. We thank you for the knowledge of the mountain of spirituality. 
It is your desire that all humans will come to the knowledge of the truth, that there is one true and living God, and there is one true and living mediator, the man Yeshua, who is also our Lord and our Savior. As your co-laborers, co-laborers with you on the earth, we join in your desire. We know it's your desire for all men to be saved. We join in your desire and we now make it our prayer that people everywhere will feel the strong sense of your presence, that they might see your love, your mercy, your righteousness, and your generosity. That they will begin to turn away from gods that are no gods at all. Gods that tell you to sacrifice humans. Gods that tell you to kill your family. Gods that tell you to go and shoot somebody else. Gods that tell you to kill other people. What sort of a God is that? No, this God wants to save. This God wants to give life. This God gave his own life, gave his own blood, shed his own blood. That is the one who deserves your worship, man. And so we pray, God, that people everywhere might turn from ungodliness, turn from Satan worship, turn from self-worship. We pray the same, oh God, for kings and rulers and leaders of society, leaders upon every mountain of society, that they might turn to you, oh Yahweh, that they might turn to you, oh Lord God, that they might call upon your name, for you are the one true and living God. And that they might seek your salvation. We pray this for the leaders of modern society. Leaders and kings in every mountain of society. That they might seek you, Lord. That godliness will flood our world. Peace and stability. Justice and fairness. And we say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Grant it, Lord, according to your power. According to your wisdom. And we say, amen. Amen. Thank you so much okay. for your time. Until we come your way again shortly, stay elevated. We love you. Bye-bye now.